continuing on with our very long example here. We've already found um, that this is a dependent sample. We found the differences using our calculator, and then we found some basic statistics about those differences, namely the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. Now we want to conduct a hypothesis test for the difference between two means for a matched pairs data set. And you'll notice this looks extremely similar to what we learned in section 10.3. That's because it is very similar. Um, it's just that here we don't have mu equal to a particular value. We have mu d equal to zero because it's always zero because this is always matched pairs. So the difference of zero is always your null state. Right? If there's no change, for example, when you subtract them, they'll have zero. So if, if I look here, person number 13 had a pain level before and after of 8, so there's no change. Okay. All right, so that's always your null hypothesis. You always assume that it's equal to 0, but other than that, it looks very, very similar to what we had before. It's using d bar instead of x bar and sd instead of s, um, but it still uses the t values and the t statistics and so on. We still have to state our conclusions and all of that. And remember, you don't have to memorize any of that. It's right in the inferential statistics packet you get to use on your test. And that was just the calculator instructions, but we'll see those as we go along. All right, so we want to conduct a test of whether there's a mean reduction in pain after the Reiki therapy using a 0.05 level of significance. Now, keep in mind, we found the differences as before minus after. So what should our hypothesis be? Hypotheses be, I should say. Well, the null hypothesis is pretty simple um, and straightforward. The null hypothesis is always going to be mu d equals zero. But the hard part is going to be figuring out our alternative hypotheses. So let me just write up a couple things first of all. So we know that we set up group one to be before. When we say before minus after like that, and it will always be given to you in a problem like this, at least for me. Of course, when you're doing some of these on your own, um, in life or whatever, then you can make it up yourself which one you want to be before, or which one you want to be group one. But we established group one to be before minus after. All right, so if that's the case, we want to know if there's a reduction in pain. So we want to know if the before group is greater than the after group, right? Because if it's reducing the pain, then the after should be smaller than the before. So we really want to know if group one is greater than group two. Well, for the null hypothesis, it doesn't really matter because the null hypothesis is that they're equal to each other. You assume that there is no difference, that the before group and the after group are equal to each other. And if that's the case and they're equal to each other, then that would mean that when you subtract them, you get no difference. You get zero, right? Just like 8 minus 8 is zero. And that would mean your mu d is equal to zero. Let me make that a little smaller just so you can see it all. There we go mu d equals zero. All right, so that's done. That's the, that's the easy one. That's always zero. Right? I don't know if you noticed, but I'll scroll back up to the hypothesis test in here. If you look at these, look at the null hypothesis for every single one of them is mu d equals zero. And remember, d stands for difference. All right, now the hard part is going to be this after and before business. So you want before to be bigger than after. That means that when you subtract them, you'll have after or before minus after is greater than zero. Let's see here, right? So if before is bigger than after, then when you subtract after from both sides, you'll have the mu of before minus the mu of after is greater than zero. In other words, mu d is greater than zero. And it's a little bit strange because you're saying a reduction, reduction normally makes you think of less than, but that is not the case in chapter 11. Chapter 11, it doesn't work that a word like less than always means left tailed like it did in chapter 10. Um, sometimes less than reduction would mean greater than, and sometimes it means less than. And it all depends on how you set up group one and group two. All right, so I just typed that up real quickly. That in chapter 11, reduction, which is a less than statement, right, um, when you see it up there, does not always mean left-tailed test. All right, so seeing that word reduction, um, that will sometimes be a left-tailed test and sometimes not, depending on the setup of group one and group two. So if the difference had been after minus before, if I had established that as the difference, then it would have been after less than before, which would mean a left-tailed test. So if I did after minus before, it would be left-tailed. If I do before minus after, it's a right-tailed. So the word reduction itself doesn't mean anything, right? 
So it gets a little confusing, but that's the way chapter 11 is. So chapter 11, you have to be really careful with the language. So pay close attention. In general, to the write-up, to the, to the words used, to the groups that are established, etc. To what direction we're taking this. Okay, next, what results do we expect from the hypothesis test based on the box plot of before and after pain levels? Ooh, box plots. All right, so that's chapter three. So when we look at this, this is before, that's the before pain level, these are the after pain levels. And from chapter three, we learned how to compare things like this. It shows us that there, there seems to be quite a big difference because the before group, um, they, they each have the same max of eight, but the before group is much more spread out and has a, the box much higher than the after group. The after group seems to be much lower. I mean, for example, look, the median right here, that middle line, is below Q1 for the other group. That seems to show us that there's some kind of lowering of the pain level. Not for everybody, because of course eight and eight is still there, but for the bulk of people. Right? So if that's the case and we expect that, that there's some lowering, we expect we will reject the null hypothesis, that we will show that the evidence supports that that alternative claim right here is true, that the before group is greater than that after group. And I just typed that up. So there appears to be a significant decrease in pain level as the median, that middle line for the after group, is lower than the Q1 for the before group. It looks actually lower than the than the minimum even, it's very low. Um, actually, I want to say the min, right? It, I think it's even lower than that minimum. It's really down there. All right, so that seems that pain levels have really plummeted, gone down after the touch therapy. So we expect to reject the null hypothesis. That's what we expect looking at the box plots. It's a good thing to remind yourself how to examine box plots. They are a lovely thing to put on final exams. All right, so now the following, oops. Sorry, I ended up taking up so much space here that I've lost my graph. There it is. Okay, so we need to see whether or not there is, um, the following is a normal probability plot. Have we matched the conditions needed to make a test? So is conducting a hypothesis test on these data possible? Actually, I believe that question was changed to um, more like what you see in your project and on your exam, which is verify that the requirements needed to conduct a hypothesis test were met. So it's not just about whether the data are normal, but it's about everything else as well. So I'm going to bring up my inferential statistics packet just so I don't have to flip back in the scroll back in the notes themselves. So we can see up here at the top, these are the requirements needed in order to conduct a hypothesis test for the mean differences. So we need to see if we have all three of them. If we have all three of them, simple random sample, um, data is either normal or we have an n greater than 30, and then little n, which is your sample size, is less than 0.05 capital N, then we're good. Okay, so let's go back to the notes right here. All right, so the first thing we need to know is do we have a SRS? So those are the requirements of the test. And the answer to that is totally. We, we completely have an SRS, although you might have missed it when we wrote it up a little while ago. So let me go back here. Uh, let's see. It's back a couple pages, sorry to say. I ended up scrolling anyway. All right, right here, when it said random sample, right there, that gives us that we have a random sample, so we have an SRS. So let me scroll back down. There, and I changed it to SRS because oh, I'm a stats person. We tend to be very lazy about our notation. So um, simple random sample, that's what that means. Okay, the next thing, oh, and I like to put a smiley face to kind of remind myself, yep, I've got it. And we, had, we need three smiley faces in order to be able to move on here. So the next thing we need to know is, is n greater than or equal to 30? Or is our data normal? Our, our data normal, I should say. So, well, we don't have 30. That, that's not possible. But we do have 13, so that's no good. But the data normal, absolutely. This graph over here shows us that the data is normal because all the dots are between the lines. There we have our second smiley face. So the graph at the left, oh, go away. Hold on. There we go. The graph on the left shows that the distribution is normal since all the points are between those boundary lines. My husband likes to call those rails because it looks like rails on a railroad track. Um, and now because we have 
cover chapter nine, you know that that's actually a confidence interval is what that is. Um, it's kind of an advanced confidence interval, but nevertheless, those two boundary lines are a 95% confidence interval. All right, we're done with that. Now the last thing is kind of a hand wave um, magician job because we need little n to be less than or equal to 0.05 capital N. So you need those 13 people to be less than 5% of all the people in the world that have had Reiki touch therapy which of course it must be, right? Um, Reiki touch therapy has been around for a long time and therefore there's been a lot of people that have had Reiki touch therapy. And so of course our little sample of 13 is far less than that. So I just typed that up. So we have our third smiley face. So of course N equals 13 is far less than 5% of capital N, capital N being all the people in the whole world who've had Reiki touch therapy, the number of people who've had Reiki touch therapy in the whole world. Right. And again, this is, we've done this several times before, but it's a little bit of a kind of a mad magician's trick. You're just kind of waving your hands at it and saying, ta-da, because of course it has to be that case. Now, and if you've been a problem you were ever given capital N, like let's say you knew N was 5 million people, then you'd stick in 5 million people and find 5% of that, and 13 would be less than that. All right, we have checked that our requirements are met for conducting the test. We figured out the hardest part of the test, which is figuring out our null and alternative hypotheses, these parts that I've underlined right here. And then um, we've also checked that we think it's gonna show us that we're gonna be rejecting the null hypothesis, but we're gonna have to wait for the next video to actually do the test because it's gonna require so much time that I can't fit it into this video. So I'll pick up here um, in the next video and we'll actually conduct the test finally.